Um, so at this point, I'd like to welcome everybody. We've got a uh, conversation or uh, introduction to an inner city bus study. I've got Theo Kossub, one of my colleagues on who's ready to talk. And uh, Theo, I believe now you can start to share. There we go. Hello, everyone. How are y'all? Let me share. I'm still unable to share that presentation while the other participant is sharing, Kari. I'm going to ask for Ray's help on this one. OK. If we can. Uh... Sorry, I apologize. I'm Kari. <laughs> Kari, I'm multitasking. Okay. I was on the That's phone, right. Deputy Executive Director. So how may I help you now? <laughs> uh, it looks like Theo is having some trouble sharing his screen. Okay, let's see. Theo, are you uh, just on the the web link? Have you downloaded Zoom by any chance? Um, you know, I have it on my computer. Yeah, it's downloaded. Okay. Um, so at the bottom of your screen, you should see a, a green uh, symbol if you hover over it that says share screen. Sure. When I try to share, it says I cannot while the other participant is sharing. Try now. <laughs> okay, there we go. It's working. All right. Sorry. Okay. Can everybody see that okay? That's good. Okay. Very good. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Theo Kossub. I am PTN's Strategic Programs Manager, and I'd like to talk today about an exciting study that the department is undertaking with the help of the KFH group. Um, we have just launched this inner city bus study. Uh, and first, let me tell you a little bit about how we got here. The Public Transportation Advisory Committee held several meetings in 2019 concerning our existing inner city bus service and our program approach. We also reviewed, the PTAC committee also reviewed the uh, inner city bus program approach of other states, in particular, uh, the Washington State Department of Transportation, because they had undertaken a recent study, and various, various other program models approach across the country. Um, after PTAC took a look at the issue several times and got stakeholder feedback, they formed what was called a revised strategic uh, direction report, which really sets in motion uh, a fresh look and approach to how our inner city bus program is conducted here in Texas. And so one of the outcomes was to undertake an inner city bus study here in Texas with the help of a consultant who in this case is KFH group. So this inner city bus project will review and assess the inner city network ICB inner city network here in Texas. Uh, it will look at identifying any unmet needs or service gaps around the state. And it will also develop, prioritize, and recommend Texas inner city bus program strategies and direction. Uh, one key thing is to also recommend uh, near term improvements uh, to the program and an implementation plan for those going forward. Now, We've come to the most important item, which is a stakeholder consultation, consultation process. So look for some surveys in the new year, 2021, and invitations to stakeholder meetings where we can get into the nitty gritty of inner city bus service and needs here in Texas. Uh, what we're looking at is to be in a place to have recommendations that we received from this inner city bus study by summer of 2021, 
with the thought that if we need to make any changes to our uh, coordinated call for projects, that we'd be in a position to do that for November when it's uh, you know posted. Um, and so that's that's a high level overview of it. Um, and what I wanted to do now is show you something that I thought was interesting that we've gotten so far from the study. Here is a cool map uh, that KFH has produced for us that shows where the ICB routes and activity is occurring in Texas. Now keep in mind this map uh, doesn't show frequency, so some of these don't run as often as others. But you can see pretty easily that uh, you know there's a lot of ICB activity, in particular in the triangle here, of course, from DFW down to Houston to San Antonio. Uh, but there's also some some meaningful connections occurring out west and through the heart of the state. Um, and I think this KFH has been great in getting this map to us. And I think there's even an update uh, to this because they've been working uh, on it. But uh, with that, I wanted to give KFH the opportunity to introduce themselves. Uh, of course, I am Theo Kossub, and if you would like to contact me directly, you can, either by phone or email. But I believe Fred, who is the project manager for KFH, is on the call. So I will let him say hello and uh, uh, perhaps introduce some of his staff. Thank you, Theo. Uh, appreciate it. And we're really glad to have the opportunity to be uh, working in Texas. Uh, just about the map, it is being continually updated. And I see that we're already getting comments with corrections on it. So we will be looking for that input as well. Um, KFH Group, some of you may know uh, through our Austin office that we've done a lot of coordination work in Texas and planning, but we've also done a lot of statewide and regional intercity and commuter bus studies around the country. And uh, so we've got expertise and our team, uh, you know, I've been the project manager on most of those things. Uh, Beth Hamby is gonna be working with me. She worked very closely with me on the Washington State intercity bus study recently. And uh, she's also an expert in federal regulations and compliance uh, among other things and funding sources. Bennett Powell, you may know him. He's in our Austin office, um, and he'll be helping a lot with the stakeholder uh, outreach engagement part of the project, particularly, and uh, helping to make sure we've got local knowledge or can get to that local knowledge uh, in Texas. Mike Kwan is in our Bethesda office, and he's uh, worked with me on several intercity bus studies. Uh, gathering the service inventory data, uh, bringing the census data to it and helping to really analyze where the unmet needs are. And as you can see, he's waded into the inventory phase uh, already. So uh, we're working closely with the uh, TxDOT team and uh, we've, we've had, uh, I would say a lot of experience in working with various states that have different strategic approaches to how to run the program. So we are able to bring that to Texas and, and help get uh, a program uh, as to the extent that it needs to be changed to, to meet the, the needs and the policy direction of the state. Thank you, Fred. And hello, Beth, Mike, and Bennett. Um, look for more to come on that ICB study. Thank you very much. Great, thank you Theo and Fred. That was good. Uh, hopefully y'all are excited about that. I think that'll be pretty interesting. Uh, next off here, we were gonna, I was gonna open it up to a general Q and A. Um, if you have questions about anything that was presented today, anything that was presented yesterday, uh, it looks like we've got some questions about the ICB study. So uh, if the KFH folks wanna, wanna hop in on that, I don't know if you're looking at the chat. Um, Mike, are you? 
Are you online? Do you have any any immediate response to that? Mike, you're muted. Yeah. And if you know, if you can pull up the map too. There we go. So there we go. Yeah. So the question was, is the darker teal line that runs from Dallas to Tulsa a Greyhound line? It's kind of hard to... Yeah, the darker line is the uh, Greyhound line. Great. Do we have any other questions about the ICB study while well, we've got everybody... Uh, Everybody on to answer, and we've got the map up. Give everyone a little bit to uh, to type something in. And I want to say we'll make sure to get uh, Marshall Fall changed to Marble Falls. I saw Andrew brought that up. And it's important, Mike, because that is the home of the Blue Bonnet Cafe that is the uh, world's greatest lemon meringue pie on the planet. Absolutely. Absolutely. I don't, I don't know if we're going to add live links to each place, though, for its. <laughs> I don't know. But, but well, that's a good idea, though. So we just had a question come up. How will y'all be assessing unmet needs for intercity routes? Um, well, one of the things we do is we look at the census data to see where there's concentrations of population that might be sufficiently uh, density and size to support a, a stop. Uh, and generally we assume based on survey data we've done in a lot of places that inner city bus riders are not walking to a bus stop, but uh, most of the ridership arises within 10 miles of the stop. Uh, in really in rural low density areas, sometimes 25 miles. So we kind of do an analysis of uh, population uh, coverage within 10 or 25 miles of existing stops. Uh, and obviously we're looking for places that have some population and density that are not within those coverage areas. Uh, we use stakeholder input and look at the network to see what methods might be used to serve those unmet uh, those areas that don't have access. And we then develop ridership and revenue estimates to see if it's really feasible to provide some kind of intercity service or connectivity to those areas. Uh, frequency is another kind of difficult issue because uh, the rural intercity bus demand tools that we have are all calibrated pretty much based around one round trip a day. So we really don't have tools that tell us a whole lot about the ridership reaction from going to two or three round trips. And generally the bus companies respond over time by simply adding frequency when there's uh, additional uh, ridership. So in some cases we would be looking at um, uh, you know, the, the stakeholder input uh, to help guide us on that. One other thing we do as an analysis is to do a map that shows whether people can make a round trip in, in the same day to a nearby major activity center. And generally that's only possible if you really got two round trips a day on your intercity bus route, but it, it reflects the extent to which you could use it for some potential regional services. So that's a, a, kind of a quick version of the unmet needs process. We also look at key destinations too. I, I have to mention that. We, we map out uh, regional medical facilities, colleges and universities, uh, a number of major types of destinations, including tourism destinations, and look to see if those are outside the service area and if there's connecting transit uh, from intercity bus to those areas that would allow people to access them. Uh, and I, I've been utterly amazed to find in some states a, a university of 15 or 20 or 30,000 people that is 
not served by any inner city bus carrier, which just says to me they're not looking. Uh, but we'll look uh, and, and for opportunities like that as well. Great, thank you. Uh, do we have any more questions related to the ICB study? I should have allotted more time for it. I didn't know it would be this popular. One other thing I should just mention that right now, uh, the private intercity bus carriers uh, were not singled out in the CARES Act for any particular funding. The only funding that's available to them comes through the 5311F program. So uh, carriers that were not uh, part of that, or if the state, each state was allowed to decide how to spend that funding. But uh, one of the things that many carriers did was to dramatically reduce their frequencies or even just suspend service during COVID because their uh, ridership dropped in some cases to 15 to 20% of its normal. And if you have to fund all of your operations out of the fare box, that's a very uh, uh, difficult situation. So if you go to the websites right now to see what the service is or what the frequency is, it, a lot of this may not be running right now. And some of these carriers may never come back. Um, and so building the inventory right in the middle of the pandemic is a bit problematic. What we're trying to do is build a model of what it was just before the COVID-19 hit. So we have historic timetable data for some carriers. Uh, some carriers are posting on their websites that uh, this is their intended schedule and they're gonna come back to it, but you better phone right now because we're only running a bus a week or on demand or whatever. Uh, and in some cases we don't know either what they were running before or what their plans are for the future. Part of the process that we're going to go through, though, is a set of consultation meetings with, with carriers uh, to ask them about their uh, uh, view of the program, their view of unmet needs, and uh, their plans for the future. So that is something that part of our overall stakeholder engagement process. Excellent. I don't know that we've had any more questions come up. Oh, uh, Mike Kwan noted that, uh, yes, the map should reflect that these are pre-COVID. Um, hopefully there'll be some way to, to note the changes, I don't know, in a, a, an appendix or something. And I appreciate the, the, you know, the information that people provide to make sure that we're as accurate as we can be. So uh, sometimes carriers leave their websites up uh, or their ticket selling system is still selling tickets through Wanderoo, even though the bus company went defunct two years ago. So uh, appreciate having the, that local knowledge. Right, wow. Yeah, if they're still selling tickets, that's a problem. <laughs> Well, nobody cleans up the internet, you know? It just. That's true. <laughs> that's true. I guess that's something we could have talked about the uh, online public involvement, too, how it's important to keep things up to date and to archive when necessary. Uh, I know we've been going through something at TechStot. You, for folks who have engaged with our main PTN website, you might have noticed that. Uh, we can often have some pretty outdated information on there, but text wide, we're looking to uh, renovate and get some easier navigation and more relevant information up there. So yeah, it's a it's an issue for everybody. Yeah, I the the previous topics about the uh, public engagement, I think that's um, uh, particularly true on there because you don't want to have people that are trying to connect and provide their input on some platform that closed a year ago or two years ago or something. Kind of like selling bus tickets if your bus company doesn't run anymore. But. Right. right. <laughs> yeah, it's not a good way to build trust. Uh, 
Great. Well, um, thanks you all for that. Are there any more questions? We've got uh, open Q&A for another, uh, I'd planned on for another 20 minutes or so. I know folks have been a little bit shy about asking things, um, but this is a chance. What I could do is start into, uh, I was gonna talk about the, the next steps from here. Oh, here we go. Is there gonna be any analysis of which agency should be operating any specific route? I think the strategic direction that we're moving in in Texas, based on what I understand from the PTAC uh, studies and discussions with TxDOT, is a situation in which the, the TxDOT as, as the program, uh, overall program manager is gonna basically be specifying the services that it thinks are the priorities and that are needed. And then applicants can apply to operate those services. So uh, the answer to the question about which agency should be operating any specific route you know, in one sense that would come from agencies applying for the funding um, uh, either in a coordinated way or the agency that applies for it, if that's a route that TxDOT wants to fund, uh, TxDOT would be looking at those proposals and choosing among them. Um, there are some states that have a portion of the program that is basically kind of set aside for public transit operators to apply for regional services. And we might be looking at some of the options like that. Oregon has uh, a portion of the program that way. And it's uh, then really up to the local regions what they want to apply for for that. Interesting question. We'll be looking at those issues. Andrew, we've got your name now. We're gonna be talking to you. Yeah, Andrew, you've just made yourself a, uh, a, a popular person with the KFH for this study. Great. So I guess while we're waiting for some more questions to come into the q and I'll start going over the next steps after the conference, what's going on. Uh, number one, I'm going to get the presentations. I'll be editing them down so you don't have to sit through an entire day. You can watch uh, in by individual presentation. I'll get the recordings up, uh, the copies of the PowerPoints up, and links to all of the resources that have been provided so far. Those will all go into the forums and I'll send an email out when those are there. Uh, as a note to that, please send me a request for a, a username if you're not already on there. I've gotten a couple so far, but uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure that there are more people who need access. Now you can, you can view everything on the forum right now, but to be able to comment, uh, react to things, you'd, you'd need an account. Uh, so after that, I had also promised you some more information going to be recording some more talks uh, specifically about uh, reporting and uh, milestone progress reports and submitting reimbursements. I've got a couple of PTCs who have volunteered to put together presentations since they're the subject, subject matter experts on those things. Uh, I'm hoping to get those out by the end of January. We've got some other follow-up topics. Uh, Andrew had mentioned the one about what's uh, how much input a public can have in a plan. I think that would be worth a conversation. Uh, we I had also considered having one on uh, hiring a consultant, things to consider. And you can maybe you can weigh in on the forums if you think it would be more helpful to have a, a call conversation type webinar or some kind of presentation recording 